We want to go back to the first day that you quote unquote quit Hollywood. Mm -hmm. If you can remember that day. Do you remember some of the emotions that you were feeling? Yes, actually. So at this time, I was an actor, right? And it was just acting. And it was the plan A, I don't need a plan B. Either I'm going to make it or that's it, right? It, it was very naive of me, but it, it, it got me a long way. So what happened was I was called out to this audition and I drove from Orange County and I drove to this, to this casting. I forget where it was, but it was somewhere by the Universal Studios, if I remember. And I remember having this inner dialogue with myself. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go to this casting. This is going to determine. And I was like talking to God. I was like, this is the one. Either, either I, I book this and something happens or I'm done. And the sign on this day couldn't have been any clearer to me that at this moment in life, the universe was like, this is just not right for you. So I go to the lot. I said, hey, I'm here for a casting. I forget what it was for. And they're like, there is no casting. I said, okay. So I checked my email. The day is right. Everything is right. Last minute, the casting director changed the audition date to another day. So that was like a, that, that was as clear as it, as it was. And I was like, okay, I got it. I got the sign. I'm done. And in that moment, I kind of get goosebumps now talking about it. But in that moment, I was like, all right, well, this isn't for me. And there was so much time and effort where for that span of like going to auditions, I was almost a Power Ranger, um, always getting callbacks and never quite getting that defining role or, or anything that could catapult me. And mind you, at the time, this is what no one ever tells you. I was in the 1% of earners in, you know, for like a, a good two to three year stretch. But what you see on TV, the Brad Pitts, the, you know, Leonardo's, they're the 1% of the 1%. So the 1% of being a working actor what is that? At the time, it was like $12,000 a year or something like that. And for a couple years, I was averaging like a solid like 40000 I was doing like for me, single guy, no wife, no kid. I was like, OK, I'm doing something. But in that moment, when I drove all that way, casting, they, they it did a few things to me where a part of me almost like broke. Because it, the, the, I've never had a signal in my life just be so clear. It was just like, okay, this isn't for you at this time. So when that happened and that switch happened, I took a couple years off. But something inside of me, I didn't see the change that I wanted to see. So when I first went out to Hollywood, this was straight out of high school, no family, no friends, no money, nothing like that. I just left. And I told myself I would be the Asian Will Smith, right? And obviously, when you go somewhere, you do something, you want to be the, the first you. That's always the answer you hear from somebody. Oh, I'm the first me. But you're always inspired by someone or something, and that's what kind of fuels you to do something. So at the time, it was Will Smith. And I was like, I want that career for myself. In hindsight... I wasn't ready for it. I thought I was. I thought I had the looks. I thought I had the personality. I thought I had the charm. But I wasn't ready for it. I was never a good auditioner. Uh, I would spend all this time you know, going over lines nonstop that you go into the room and you think about the lines so much that it deteriorates the performance compared to just performing. And in hindsight, when I think about what I did wrong, because at the time you almost feel when you see colleagues that you've worked with and you see them doing well and you see them doing all these big shows that you auditioned for and you didn't get and you see them doing, you know, movies like Shazam and all this stuff, you, naturally you feel a certain way. But as you get older you be, and you mature as a human being, you become happy for their success. Because that their success doesn't take away from your success. 
So when someone succeeds, you should always look at it from a place of, well, if they can do that, I can do that. And use that as an inspiration to kind of rocket you to do whatever it is that you want to do. You were 18 when you flew to Los Angeles from where? Georgia. From Georgia, yes. okay. So you, even though you'd been raised somewhere else? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, but, you know, my goal was always to get out of the island. So my mom at the time lived in Georgia. So after my freshman year in uh, Hawaii, which was the school was Ka'au, it's Ka'au, K-E-A-A-U, high school, uh, I moved to Georgia. And we thought, well, in Hawaii, there's a saying like, oh, if you want to better your life, you go to the mainland. So my mom was in Georgia. So I stayed with my mom from my sophomore year to my senior year. And fun, there, there's a funny story about how this led to me moving to L.A. So when I was junior, senior high school, my best friend and I were into tuner cars. Our whole group was into tuner cars. And on this night, I don't even know if I should be talking about this, but it's fine. On this night, uh, we were driving and he had like a, a souped up MX-6, had a KLZE motor swap and all this stuff. And then I had an MX-3 nothing fancy but we were driving side by side on the main road and we were like talking because at this age i was like really hyper i was like hey what's up man we were just talking and a cop pulled us over uh and we got tickets for street racing so my license got suspended so i couldn't drive i forget what the length was i don't know if it was six months or a year i just i don't remember but we couldn't drive and upset because that's your freedom, right? Being able to drive is your freedom as a teenager. Uh, my mom, so all of this is, is really thanks to my mom because she heard on the radio that there was this acting school coming and the school's name is John Roberts Powers at the time. I don't know what they're doing now, but at the time that's what it was called. And they were at the radio and there was this big convention center and everyone brought their kids and it was just packed. It was packed. I didn't want to go. I was like, I'm not going to this stupid acting thing because it's not anything. It wasn't with me as a kid. I never thought to myself, oh, I want to be an actor. I want to be a director. I didn't care. Right. I was playing basketball. Um, but she forced me to go. So we sat down. I don't know if it was the, the director or the rep or whoever it was at this event, but he asked, hey, who can do this commercial for me right now? And for some reason, I just raised my hand because I thought it was dumb. I was like, yeah, I can do it. It's not a problem. So he said, okay, I want you to pretend it's a baby diaper commercial and you're putting the diaper on the baby or whatever it was. I'm surprised I remember that. Um, and I did it. No hesitation. I just did it. I was like, oh, you know. And, and I guess he was so impressed that I was able to do it that he invited me to their Atlanta location. Um, and he paid for everything. So he paid for the teachers, he paid, and my mom would drive me in the mornings really early, like five or 6 a.m., wait all for the eight, four to eight hours that we were there, and then drive back, right? So she would wait, and we did that for a year. And after that year, there was a, Ve uh, a Las Vegas event called IPOP at the time. And I, uh, they paid for me to go to Vegas, to go to the event, and everything. So then I got an agent out there at the time. Obviously, you're uh, naive at the time. I don't know anything. I don't, I didn't, I'm like, oh, I got an agent, right? From, from Georgia at the time. It's not like now where all the productions are moving to Atlanta. But you just don't know. You think, I have an agent. I'm going to be something. So at this crux in my life, not having any family members that graduated from college, not having anyone that's successful financially. So there, at that point, there's no one to look to. I uh, my, it was like, this is my golden ticket. This is how I'm going to build a life, right? Um, so once I got the agent and I graduated high school, I sold my radio. I had like this nice boombox stereo. I sold it for a couple hundred bucks and then I flew to, to California. And that is how I ended up in California. Where did you end up? Uh, at the time, it was, I believe it's Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard. And then I moved to Granada Hills. And then Granada Hills, I just kind of went south the whole time. Like every, because I got fired 
uh, I was a waiter at Olive Garden and I got fired because I saw a pretty girl. There was a guy at the table with her and another girl. And I'm, I'm assuming the guy liked the girl. And I, I asked for her number while I was waiting their table. <laughs> and uh, he complained. And then I got fired. So when I got fired, everything kind of crumbled because that was the way of how I made money. And he said something? Sorry. He said, yeah, he oh. said something. And being 18 with no skill set, right? It's like, how else do you get a job? Because you have to balance between making it to auditions and working. So at that point, it was like place to place, renting rooms, couch surfing, living in the car, going here, going here, just, just kind of doing that whole thing for a long time. Sorry, did they bring, did, did you need to bring them extra breadsticks? I mean, to make them have, just, to, just to appease him? Yeah, you know what? I, I didn't know. Oh, okay, so yeah. I, it's, that's, there that's was no up. flirting between them. There was yeah. nothing. I just, and being young. Sure, you're 18. I, I was 18. And I, and I just saw a pretty girl and I was just like, hey, what's up? You're cute. What's your name? Sure. Yeah. Um, whereas in hindsight, it was well worth it, right? Because I met my wife and had our son and that's how life turned out. So it was well worth it. But in that moment, it led to a lot of struggling, which I can't really blame it on that because I have to take responsibility. I'm the one that shouldn't have asked for a phone number while working. So it all comes back to being my fault. But that, that, that's the crux of how I ended up in Los Angeles. So do you mind if I ask how long were you living in the car couch surfing? So th those, that was probably like a good year. That was probably like a good year because what happens is, and along the way, I had a lot of people help me out, right? You don't make it living on uh, couch surfing, living in your car and stuff. You don't make it on your own. And uh, there's people that tip their head in here and there, whether it was you know, someone giving you 10, 20 bucks, whether it's someone letting you stay on the couch for a night. I used to park my car into the neighborhoods to go to sleep. So, and there was a, there was a couple girls at the time that, uh, <laughs> that let me stay at their place and shower because, you know, I didn't have money for a gym membership to go shower at the gym. So, you know, every couple weeks or so often they would let me kind of stay for a night and then that was it. And you kind of just, navigate and find your way and the way it kind of worked i never had credit i didn't have anyone that had good credit i didn't have anyone that had money so i couldn't say hey let's get this apartment or this house um but what i did have was charm and just perseverance so anytime i would get that big commercial check right or and, and this was the time i don't know what it's like now because i haven't been in any commercials recently but like at the time when I did like a McDonald's commercial or anything like that, you know, I got like 20, 30,000 for one day of work. That would last me six, seven, eight months of rent and gas and insurance to kind of make it to the next gig, right? Whereas now in hindsight, I'm like, man, if I got a $40,000 check like that, I would just put it down on a down payment on a house, rent out all the rooms, and then they have them pay for my mortgage. And then that way you can focus on something else because your roof is taken care of, so. No. Sure, but it took it took a while for you to get that kind of financial literacy. Yes, and, yes, and, and a lot of hard hard breaks. Oh no, I was gonna say yeah, that all that all came because of my wife. So my wife is much better with finances, and she's more successful than I am. And when I met my wife, first day I met her, I told her, "Hey, we're getting married, and I'm giving you a boy." We got married, and I gave her a boy. Oh wow. And what she told me, there there's a few things she told me. She said, you're going to get life insurance, right? So I got life insurance and you're going to go back to school. So I went back to school for IT. And now my day job, I'm, I'm in IT. I'm a, a network engineer. And that's how I made money. So the, by her forcing me to go back to school, I took a loan on half and she paid for the other half. So really, she invested in me as her life partner. By doing that and getting that stability, I was very lucky because I had somebody, again, help me along the way to become the man that I am today. It didn't just happen by myself. Like, yeah, I put in the effort, you know, studying and making sure I show up and get things done. But it was because my wife said, I know you're capable of more, so you're going to do more. She was the wind to my sale, right? As cheesy as that sounds. So 
by me going back to school, getting that stability, now having a skill set, I'm able to create and do so much more and, and help inspire other people because I'm not worrying about where food's coming from. I'm not worried about the roof over my head. I'm not worried about, you know, life. Not, not to say that there isn't things to worry about, but I'm just not worried about life because I know whether I'm working for somebody, whether I'm working for myself, whether I get fired tomorrow, I have a skill set. And with that skill set, you'll always be able to make money to support your family. So with that stability as a filmmaker, an actor, a director, producer, writer, you're able to create like never before because you're not worried about the struggles of life. So back to the earlier question, when I was an actor, just a pure actor in, in, in Hollywood struggling, you couldn't really get as good as you want to be because so much of your focus is where am I sleeping tonight? How am I going to get food? Right? And these are my Ralph's chicken tenders with mac and cheese days. Or that, that was my meal, right? So once you're able to take care of the core of living as a human being, you're able to fully express yourself as a creator. That's excellent. And a good point, too, is when you have these quote unquote gypsy jobs here in L.A., mm -hmm. someone else's term that I've, I've stolen. So gypsy jobs, which are, you know, hey, we need you to, to do this promotion or whatever for a week. That's great and they can pay well. But then you have to look for new work mm -hmm. and you're always your time is spent looking for work mm -hmm. as well. So same with acting. Did you have a backup plan when you came to L.A.? No. And that in hindsight. That's probably one of the things I would have done different. Um, obviously the life that we're on is the life that we're on and the things that happen you cannot change. But if I could still have the life that I have today but make some adjustments along the way so that journey was uh, not as turbulent, I would have had a plan B. And even now, being in the position that I'm in now, filmmaking is a hobby until it generates more than my career. And I tell anybody, it's like, hey, if you want this to be your number one, then it has to generate more than your current number one. Because as a human being, as a father, as a husband, uh, you have a responsibility to your family to provide. So because I have a family, I'm not 18 or 19. And if I were to give any advice to someone that's 18 or 19, I'd say, hey, have your plan B and have your plan A and do that in parallel. Because eventually they can do this. But if, you're, if what you want to do as A doesn't pan out, then at least your B is going to take care of you through life. Because whether you succeed or whether you don't succeed, time is going to go anyways. So you might as well pursue it, but pursue it the right way. I see a lot of times where younger people, and I was one of them, that say, I don't need a plan B. I'm going to make it on plan A. But what happens when you spend 10, 12, 15 years doing something and it doesn't happen, right? Time goes by fast. At one moment, you're 18, then you're 25, then you're 30, then you're 35. And it's like, okay, well, what do I do? Well, if you rock your plan A, let's say this is Hollywood, right? Whether it's a writer, producer, any, anything creative, this is plan A. Plan B is, uh, you're a dental assistant, you're a real estate agent, you're a mechanic, it doesn't matter. If you do this like this, eventually, if this pans out and you give enough water to this seed, hopefully you can do this, right? And this can now be the main thing that you're doing. But a lot of times where artists tend to go wrong is they don't see the show business of it. We all want to create and not talk numbers. But if something doesn't do well, then you can't sustain it. The business of Hollywood itself wouldn't sustain itself if it doesn't make money. So I say all that to say this. If you want to be a producer, writer, director, there's two things. Make sure you have food on your table. So if you're living with your parents, stay with them as long as you can because life is just easier. And to just do it. 
just do it. It doesn't matter if it's a small project, big project, big budget, no budget, just do it because you're gonna get better as time goes on. But if you don't do it and you expect somebody to just give you that handout, but you're on level zero, there's no way you can get to level 10 without going through one through nine.